Hi, everybody. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Harold McGee. I'm a big fan of his work. Um, I'll give a very brief intro and then we'll just get right into it. So Harold did his undergraduate at Caltech, uh, not in sensory science, but in literature. And then he went on to do a PhD, not in sensory science or chemistry, but in uh, literature as well. So studying the romantic poetry of John Keats uh, and focusing on poetry and uh, the senses that are kind of described and emoted in poetry. Uh, and then he wrote what has become a seminal book on cooking, on food and cooking, the science and lore of the kitchen. And now he has a new book out, Nosedive, A Field Guide to the World's Smells. Uh, I read the book, I was blown away, and uh, I'm really excited to be talking with you today, Harold. Wonderful to be with you, Alex. Thanks, thanks so much for inviting me on. Absolutely. Um, you know, it would be great to have this in person, but that's not possible. It hasn't been for about a year, so thanks for for being accommodating. No, my uh, very glad to do it. <laughs> so, you know, when I when I saw your your new book came out, um, I bought it immediately because that's very much up the line of of what I do. Um, so, uh, just for those that don't know, uh, I study uh, the sense of smell and, and applied machine learning and artificial intelligence to uh, the sense of smell. And uh, as I was just reading the table of contents of your book, I, I felt like a kindred spirit almost to someone that had explored the world of smell and was curious not just in why things smell the way that they do, but all the different smells that are out there in the world. I'm, I'm really curious how you got started down this path. Well, uh, as you mentioned, I, um, uh, for most of my life, have been writing about food and cooking and the, the science thereof, the uh, chemistry, biology, physics, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, when I got into writing about food and cooking, which was, as again, you mentioned, uh, after I had a, a brief period teaching the poetry of uh, the English romantics, uh, it seemed to me that uh, the, the most interesting thing about the subject was flavor. Uh, you know, that's the, the part of it that's um, that, that gives us the most immediate pleasure, but it's also the most um, intangible, the, the, the hardest to kind of pin down. And so back in the 1970s and 80s, when I was first writing about the subject, I really wanted to write something about flavor and its nature, and uh, there just wasn't a whole lot of information. We really didn't know what was in the materials that give us those those sensations. And then we didn't really know that much about what goes on in us when we have those sensations. So I didn't write very much about it. I just kind of you know uh, kept an interest in it, but didn't do much with it until um, around 2000, 2005, something like that, when I had finished revising um, my first book on food and cooking. And I looked around and saw that, um, the flavor world had changed. Uh, we'd we'd uh, found the olfactory receptors and knew something about them. And um, uh, there was just much more information about the, the volatile chemistry of materials around us. And so I thought maybe the time was ripe to write a book about flavor at long last. I decided to do, to do that, and then uh, in the course of writing about flavor, um, realized that uh, just as interesting as why foods have the uh, sense uh, cause the sensations they do have the properties they do. Um, uh, just as interesting as that was why th things in the world that foods often seem to echo uh, have the aromas they do. You know, why is it that? Uh, wine tasters sometimes talk about wines having a, a leathery smell or the smell of flowers. You know, we don't eat a whole lot of flowers, but uh, we enjoy them in certain contexts in, in consumables. So I, that got me curious as to why flowers smell the way they do. Why does leather smell the way it does? And that took me down the rabbit hole of trying to understand why everything that we can smell smells the way it does. And that was a 10 year journey. Yes, I, I told my publisher it would be a two year journey. And so I was, I was overdue for eight years. <laughs> oh, the stress of that must have been counterbalanced by the joy of the exploration of the process. Yeah, no, what, what kept me going was just the cool stuff that I just kept yeah. turning up day after day after day. I mean, 
you can kind of see it in the structure of the book. You have a chapter on spices, which may have been where it started. And then you, you get into some different territory. One of my favorite examples is uh, ants that taste like lemongrass or alternatively, depending on where you're raised in the world, uh, some plant that tastes like ants. Exactly. Yeah. When, when you take a step back from, uh, from flavors and from the smells of the world, what you realize is that, uh, you know, we, we grow up uh, being used to certain flavors, certain smells, certain sensations coming to us in certain contexts, but those contexts aren't universal. And so there is this wonderful um, uh, anecdote I was able to tell about going to a lecture by a chef from Brazil who has spent a lot of time studying uh, what's eaten in the Amazon. And uh, there are ants in the Amazon that are uh, beloved by people there for their flavors. Um, and they um, have the flavors that reminded the chef of le lemongrass and ginger. And he would talk to the, the uh, people in the Amazon about that. They'd never seen lemon lemongrass or ginger. So he would bring herbs to them the next time he came and ask what they thought. And they would say, oh yeah, it's really nice. Tastes just like ants. <laughs> um, so it, it's it's very much, um, uh, it, it, I think, wonderful to keep in mind how important it is, uh, how, um, how our experience of things is determined by our past experience and therefore how we can open our experience to the world by by taking in this knowledge that comes to us from other cultures. You, you kind of mention in that the intimate connection between smell and memory and cultural context and growing up is definitely like forms the foundation of our memories and and who we are. I'm, I'm curious how you think about um, sense and food memories. Well, uh, they certainly are vivid. And, you know, for a lot of people, they're um, very powerful and can can take you back in a flash to uh, a moment in your past uh, that that was somehow charged with, with significance of, of one kind or another, sometimes good, sometimes not so good. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's something that's been remarked on for a long time. I suppose there are kind of brain anatomical, um, reasons for that, or at least just so stories that we can tell us, tell ourselves about why that might be. It seems to me it's also partly a matter of the fact that, you know, with our other senses we're they're kind of constantly on. So we're always taking in visual and, and auditory information uh, and um, are seeing things and hearing things all the time. In the case of you know, partic particular smells like the, the perfume that a, your grandmother might have worn or something like that, that's much more episodic. You know, we're, mm. we're not really exposed to those kinds of things all the time. And so there's that opportunity for the... Um, a, a particular experience of a particular stimulus being um, a kind of a, a landmark in your memory the way it, it wouldn't be otherwise. Yeah, the and at, at the very least, we can only smell half the time because we have to breathe out sometimes. Um, I guess that's a different kind of smell. Um, so I, I guess they call that retronasal olfaction where you shoot air back through your nose. Um, and that's uh, kind of an important part of flavor. I mean, maybe you could just talk a bit about what makes taste different than flavor. Yeah, well, and that is uh, uh, one of the wonderful things about smell. And in fact, the reason that I had to write the book I did uh, is that it really is this um, really unusual link between the external world and what it is that we choose to make part of ourselves. So as you say, when we breathe in, we're taking in uh, molecules and information from the world around us. And then when we breathe out, we're uh, experiencing the molecules that we have taken in to nourish ourselves. And um, in the case of flavor, um, which was my initial interest in all of this, uh, flavor really comes down to 
uh, several different senses working in concert with each other to give us an overall impression of a food or a drink. Um, uh, the two most prominent of those being taste uh, and smell. Taste is what we experience on the tongue and uh, gives us information about maybe a, a half dozen to a dozen different uh, possibilities, different um, uh, sensations. This is like a sweet, sour, savory, those kinds of things? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. And and I like to think of them as kind of the the foundation of flavor. They're limited, but they're really essential to, you know, registering what it is that we're enjoying as food and not just as, as a perfume. Um, so they're the foundation, but then the, the superstructure and all the really interesting um, variation and diversity in flavor comes from smell. Mm. And, and there we have um, many more receptors that are capable of detecting and, and informing our brains about um, many more different molecules in the world. That's how we get the, 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 the main pleasure, I think, from flavor. So then taste is what's on your tongue and smell is what's in your nose and flavor is somehow, a, a, would you say, like a collaboration between the two? Yeah, uh, those two, and then also uh, touch, because oh. um, you know when we're when we're eating something or drinking something, we have the the perception that it's you know in our mouth. We we know something about its texture. If it's spicy, then it's kind of uh, you know uh, triggering a bunch of other receptors, but they're they're more allied to touch than anything else. Um, and so uh, it, it's really interesting how uh, smell is what gives flavor its its uh, higher dimensions, as it mm. were. But we always think of them as arising from the mouth, not from the nose, mm. because that's where all the other action is. So the brain somehow tells us to, you know, to put all that together, but keep it in our mouth. And so it's, it's something that, unlike uh, sniffing a rose, is something that's always anchored in the experience of, of chewing and swallowing. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. That kind of uh, displacement of the sensory experience. So, you know, you mentioned flavor as being this meld of really all of our senses. I mean, maybe sound too. I mean, part of the joy of eating potato chips is the cr the crunch. You can feel it and, and hear it. Uh, it'd be weird actually if it was a silent potato chip. Uh, I think that would probably freak me out. Um, but I'm curious. You know, when one of those drops, when one of those senses drop out, it really can dramatically change the experience. And I think this is occurring um, more often than perhaps is just kind of being recognized, which is people are losing their sense of smell during COVID, uh, maybe perhaps because of COVID. I think the jury is still out scientifically about what actually is going on there. Um, I'm curious what your thoughts are on, you know, what happens when you lose smell and what happens to your enjoyment of, of food or your ability to kind of live in the world. Yeah, well, it's something that I, um, for better and worse, uh, have had personal experience with, happily not due to COVID, but uh, in the course of writing this book several years ago, I woke up one morning and made my usual uh, cup of coffee and uh, noticed that I really didn't like it for some reason. And then I realized that it, it was because I couldn't smell the coffee. I could still taste it, so it was hot and bitter and astringent, and that was it. No, no coffee aroma, none of the wow. part of the experience that actually makes it a pleasure <laughs> to drink. Um, and I, I didn't have any other symptoms. You know, I didn't have a, a head cold or anything like that. Uh, so I got in touch with my friends in the old faction world and asked them, uh, what was going on and what should I do about it and uh, for reassurance that it would come back. And um, at the time, this was several years ago, and I think it's still the case now, nobody really knows what's going on when your sense of smell drops out like that. And um, uh, so uh, they said, just you know, bide your time. Usually it comes back, but sometimes it doesn't. And um, so for a couple of months, I actually lived without um, being able to smell things. And of course, it took the, the pleasure out of eating and drinking. Uh, that's uh, kind of obvious. It also made it much more difficult to cook um, because in the kitchen, you know, you're using your sense of smell to 
clue you into what's going on as you're cooking, you know, the mm. progress, um, something as simple as, uh, you know, leaving the toast in the, in the, in the toaster too long. I, I burned toast all the time because it was, um, uh, I, I would set it so that it would, it wouldn't overcook and then, uh, it wouldn't be brown enough for me. So I'd put it back in, turn it on again. And of course it would be burned to a crisp, but I wasn't aware of that until I saw the smoke. Um, and then just walking around uh, outdoors and not getting that sense of fresh air, mm. um, walking back into my house and not recognizing that, you know, this is the place I live. There are all these uh, kinds of subliminal aspects of life that, uh, that smell contributes to that, that just uh, went missing. Wow, that's powerful. And when it, when it came back, what was the first thing you went went to smell or what was the first thing you smelled and what was the first thing you knew you needed to go experience again? <laughs> well, it came back gradually. That's the oh, thing. You know, I would, um, when they told me, my friends, uh, it may or may not come back and there's no real schedule. I would just every morning make myself make myself that cup of coffee and inhale really deeply, hoping to get something. And eventually I started to get something, but it was, you know, very faint to begin mm -hmm. with. And uh, some things I could smell, other things I couldn't. So it was a very gradual process. It wasn't something where I could really go out and, and celebrate by, you know, putting my nose into something particular. <laughs> I have I have this imagination of like a Rocky training montage where you're smelling all these things and then you, you know, you, you celebrate the, the smell that you wished you could have experienced at the very end. But of course, life is always messier than that. Yeah. Um, that's really interesting. I mean, do you, did you, did you, did you leave with a greater appreciation of sense or just a, a kind of a gratitude of what, of what you had had? Well, um, you know, in a way I was glad to have had the experience because I've, I've been in touch with, you know, a few people who have had that happen and had anosmia as it's called for a variety of reasons and would just have to try to imagine what it was like. And so um, it was. It was good to have the experience, simply to then appreciate uh, what that sense provides day to day, even when you're not paying that much attention to it. I mean, my my book is an an attempt to get people to pay more attention to it. But even if you're not, uh, it's it's important. I'd like to get back to that notion or at least strategies for paying more attention to smell. But I do want to ask one of the questions that showed up in the chat, because I think it touches on your, you know, trajectory and, and the topic at hand. And the question is from Jadrian Miles and says, can you tell us something about smell and taste in literature? And are there particular books or literary traditions that handle these senses especially well? Uh, uh, it's a great question. And the, uh, the poet who I wrote my dissertation about, John Keats, is especially celebrated among the English poets for having uh, clearly loved uh, all, the, all the sensations to do with um, uh, the way things feel and smell and taste and, and so on. Um, but of course the, uh, I, well, and uh, I've, I've enjoyed over the years, um, you know, going back and reading various things and just kind of stumbling onto passages that are very vivid, um, uh, along those lines. I'm curious uh, if you know of an example that you have as a favorite. Well, so, uh, Proust of course is the, uh, the one that's usually referred to, um, uh, because there's that passage very early on in uh, in search of lost time where he uh, takes a bite of a cookie and a sip of tea and is transported somewhere he doesn't know he just knows he's there, there's something going on in his brain in his mind and he and he has to actually work hard to track it back to an experience that he had in childhood and then, out of that unfolds the the whole novel. That's the famous passage. But I what I really love in Proust is another passage that really inspired me, which was uh, about the experience of drinking orange juice. <laughs> and uh, he just pauses and says, "You know, it's it's um, uh, it was a 
for him in that moment, a very vivid thing that made him realize momentarily that there was a whole world and a whole um, um, uh, narrative in that sip of, of orange juice, because here's this, this thing from a completely different kingdom of life that is somehow giving him such deep pleasure and nourishing him without knowing him. Uh, it, and it just made him think that, you know, if I had the time and the energy and the focus, I could really find out something about the essence of this thing that is affecting me so strongly. So instead of the, the focus being on him, the, the focus was on the orange and, mm -hmm. and its significance. And that's what I ended up taking as my my kind of mantra for uh, for the book. And in, in the in the book, I mean, you you did spend the time and effort, you know. So you kind of took up Proust's challenge, as it were, and you don't really shy away from anything. I mean, that was the part that's kind of striking to me about about the book when when you kind of consider it all all together is you kind of approach the vile and the divine, the sublime with kind of equanimity. And I think you, you told me a story a bit before about an experiment that you did with rotting meat, you know, to just experience that sensory percept. Yeah, uh, well, it, it seemed to me that if I was going to, uh, as I ended up deciding to, uh, write about the smells of the world, not just food and drink, well, the world includes uh, wonderful smells, but also not so wonderful smells. And I thought it was as important to understand the not so wonderful as the as the wonderful. And um, so in the case of, you know, rotting meat, uh, or, you know, a corpse, uh, the 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 smells of the decay of the animal body are uh, significant. They're important. Uh, they're uh, it, even though we've kind of scrubbed them mostly from our daily lives, uh, they can't be avoided all the time uh, completely. And I wanted to be able to uh, not only tell people from the scientific literature what are the molecules that are responsible for those smells, but to to give a, a sense for what they actually do smell like and. What I found was that you know by by smelling intentionally smelling things that are unpleasant, I was able to kind of uh, put the the hedonic side of it um, to one side. The you the, mean like the pleasure or displeasure aspect of, yeah, of smelling? Yeah, exactly. To not to worry so much or to or to try to um, sideline my kind of gut. Um, uh, response and try to pay attention to what was going on. You know, what, how would I characterize the smell? What, what, how would I describe it to another person? Um, uh, what about it uh, is, seems to be the disgusting part of it. You know, is it, uh, is there anything in it that, that might be uh, enjoyable? And what, what I found was that um, uh, there are molecules that, uh, are responsible for the disgusting smells of rotting flesh. But those same molecules are also found in things that we find very pleasant, including some flowers, uh, jasmine in particular. It's got a funk um, to it if you get up close. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and it's also kind of what makes you go back for another sniff because mm. you think, hmm, that's, that's interesting. That's not your usual, you know, straightforward rose smell. That's, there's something else going on there. Uh, and then uh, there's, there's another uh, molecule that you often find in meat that has been um, taken to the point of being charred which again is kind of not surprising because you're taking animal flesh and you're decomposing it with heat rather than with microbial action. And you get some of those same molecules and they, in the context of cooked meat, again, are recognizable, but, but the context is different and they can be pleasant. So I thought it was important to, to have those experiences and, and try to convey them to people. And you know, those nasty molecules depending on how much of them there are, it can kind of be actually, you can take something that's not so great and actually can be really, really wonderful. Uh, do you have any kind of experiences with that of, of diluting things and kind of experiencing something different? 
Well, I, yeah, I think that's actually the key to these things that are, you know, disgusting when that they're the, 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 um, you know, the main show, but if they're pl playing a supporting role rather than the, the headliner role, meaning that there's just less of that molecule and there's more of something else, uh, in the mixture as well. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of being the dominant, um, molecule they're they're there in the supporting cast, uh, that that can make a tremendous difference. And uh, there are wonderful stories actually from very early on in the history of chemistry of people noticing this. Um, Robert Boyle, back in the 17th century, talked about uh, walking down the street in London and smelling something that struck him as being really, really pleasant. And then they turned the corner and, and came upon a, a huge, like a, a block's worth of horse manure <laughs> that was just sitting there. And, uh, you know, that that's a, a perfect example of how uh, the, the, both the, the context, but also the uh, concentration of these molecules can make a tremendous difference in your, your perception of them. And you can, from what your, your, your story kind of tells me is you can sometimes control how much concentration you get by just how close your face is to the thing that's generating the, the smell. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and a couple of uh, fun things along those lines. One is that my son, uh, when he was learning how to taste wine, when he turned 21, he said, let's, let's, uh, you know, go to a wine bar and you can teach me about these different regions and so on. He, he just kind of uh, instinctively developed the habit of um, picking up a glass of wine and and holding it at, at arm's length and then slowly bringing it closer to him, sniffing all the time. And he, he would pick up different aspects of the aroma uh, as as he went. So that's now become my standard <laughs> wine wow. tasting technique. But uh, I was also at, at a, um, a museum in London, the Design Museum, which uh, had a, a big open atrium. It was maybe five or six stories tall with an open atrium and the um, cafeteria was on the ground floor. And I uh, came in and um, took the elevator to the top floor to see a special exhibition and then walked down the atrium to, to, to leave. And uh, it was two in the afternoon or something like that. The cafeteria had been very active, and I could smell very different smells as I came down that, oh, that atrium beautiful. because the the lighter molecules, the smaller molecules, had flown to the top very quickly. The heavier ones were down, still down at, at uh, ground level, and so I got this kind of spectrum of aromas from the uh, from the kitchen as I walked down the stairs. That's like a building sized gas chromatograph, um, you know, this instrument that perfumers and other people in chemistry use to take a formula and then basically shatter it into its pieces uh, and and smell each piece if you attach like a little, you know, smelling port to it. Um, have you ever, I mean, is that like uh, correspondence makes sense to you? Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. Um, and uh, I've, I've been lucky a couple of times in my, li my life to, to experience uh, that um, that uh, instrumentation. Oh, and, you've actually used a gas chromatograph, uh, yeah. the GCO. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what did uh, you smell? What was kind of broken apart for you to smell in, in its pieces? Well, in one case, it was uh, pistachios. <laughs> and the reason for that was I went to Turkey and uh, tasted pistachios, fresh pistachios there, which, of course, they use a lot in, in pastries and so on. They were just like nothing I'd ever tasted before in my life. And mm -hmm. I live in California, so you can get pistachios grown here very easily. But these were nothing like that. And I told a friend of mine who was a graduate student um, in the viticulture and enology department at UC Davis about this. And she said, well, you know, if you want to come up on the weekend when nobody's using the equipment, we can, we can check that out and see what's going on. So we use this instrument, which, as you say, separates the the all the different notes in a given material um, by virtue of their molecular size, to to a large extent anyway. But it's able to kind of spread them out over time, so that you can then 
put your nose at the at the end of the machine and sniff. And as they come out of the machine, you can um, detect them and describe them. And uh, uh, it turned out that the uh, volatile compounds in Turkish pistachios are essentially identical to the ones that you find in California pistachios. We did a side by side, but in the uh, Turkish pistachios, they were like between 10 and a hundred fold more abundant. And so you really got this, uh, to me, the, these pistachios um, tasted like mangoes. Really? like nuts because the those um, fruity notes were just so powerful so, so when you turn up the volume on pistachio you get mango is that the the idea yeah yeah and in fact uh, it's kind of fun you know if you uh, even if you haven't experienced that before nowadays if I uh, eat a California pistachio which is really all I have access to these days uh, if I if I focus on that and think mango, yeah, you can you can get the echo, and I think that's one of the fun things about um, about learning more about aromas. Uh, if you like food and drink, is that the more you learn about these uh, correspondences, about these echoes, uh, and you just keep them in mind, you can you can pick them up in a way that you wouldn't otherwise if you're just kind of enjoying it for its own sake. So, how can I be a better smeller? How can I do more of what you just described? Well, just by practice, uh, and that—that's the nice thing. Practice in this case is not you very know, enjoyable. <laughs> yeah, you, you don't have to sweat; it doesn't hurt. <laughs> uh, you just um, eat and drink with uh, attentiveness um, mm. and notice what you can, and then sometimes do uh, exercises that I think can be a lot of fun. For example, uh, cola is a—it's a composite flavor. Mm -hmm. It's made up uh, out of, and has been for a long time, a handful of different um, uh, aromas. Well, you can look online and find out what those aromas are and then sip on a cola and try to pick them out, try to notice their presence. Or if you uh, did something a little more uh, active, if you have a, a reasonable spice rack, then you can take uh, the the uh, different containers of things like fenugreek and turmeric and ginger and cumin and so on and smell those and then smell uh, either a commercial curry powder or a curry powder that you make yourself out of those ingredients and see how once you take these um, particular identifiable notes and mix them together in that way, they not only um, become a little bit harder to identify, but they then begin to generate a, an overall composite that's its own thing. Hmm. Um, so th those kinds of things, I think, can be um, uh, a lot of fun. And these days, um, with shopping on the web so easy and um, uh, you know small kind of niche communities uh, forming so readily, you can find uh, all kinds of single molecule uh, aromas uh, or essential oils that are being used in perfumery and flavoring um, uh, foods and so on. You, so you can buy the individual components that we usually encounter as uh, notes in a chord um, uh, mixed with other things, but you can now get them on their own and begin to learn for yourself you know, what those individual notes are like. I mean, what's kind of available at our fingertips now would be something to make the perfumers of the 1700s quite envious that, you know, we've already exploded the pistachio and we kind of know all the molecules and you can buy them and maybe even mix them together to create your own pistachio. Uh, what, one thing we can't do online, I mean, right now we're taking advantage of the fact that we've digitized sound, you know, and we've digitized vision. Uh, but I don't know what your house smells like. I presume like books, right? I can see a lot of books. Um, you know, I presume like a chair made of cloth has a particular warm kind of smell. There's that wool type of smell. Um, but the rest is inaccessible and I can only imagine it. Um, wh what do you imagine a world would, would be like if we could store and transmit smells? 
Uh, yeah, it would. Uh, I, I find it hard to imagine because uh, uh, it it just seems. Um, uh, yeah, it, smells are so um, so material in a sense. You know, they're 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 emanations from the things around us. At least these days, even if that thing is a, a vial of chemicals that somebody's put together, but it's something right there that you stick in front of your nose. And um, with with vision and with hearing, you know, we're we're able to uh, kind of transduce. Uh, photons and pressure waves uh, into other media and then recreate them uh, uh, in another place. I, it's hard for me to imagine how that's going to happen with molecules, which are what actually trigger our sense of smell. Uh, unless we um, figure out a way, for example, of uh, coming up with like a, a crayon box worth of chemicals that could somehow, when mixed in the right permutations and combinations, give you exactly the smells that you're that you're looking for. Like primary colors, for but for odor or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, and you know, I do, um, I, I have still a uh, scratch and sniff card from the movie Polyester, which was <laughs> done by John Waters back in the 1970s which is a way of, uh, in a sense, getting you to experience something in a movie theater that's that's supposed to be happening on screen. But even there, and, and by the way, the, the, um, the, the uh, uh, micro-encapsulated aromas are still there. I can scratch the different circles for, again, flavor, uh, smells that are nice and not so nice. Uh, and they're they're right there. They come right out. They they uh, are as strong as they used to be. Um, but apart from uh, something like that, I it, it, it's just hard for me to imagine digitizing smell the way that we've digitized um, sound and and uh, vision. Yeah, I think it's kind of a far out idea. And you know what kind of strikes me is in your trajectory in your career. You, you started out and there just wasn't that much known about flavor in the first place. And so you had to wait to write the book that you just wrote. Um, you know, we knew as much about uh, vision as we know about flavor like 300 years ago, 400 years ago. Uh, and so it's, it, to me, we feel like it's modern, like we're in the modern era. And yet we know so little about this extremely important aspect of our, of our lives. And now in COVID, I think people are realizing not just that we don't know about it, but how how important it is when you lose it or when it distorts. Like in you know, anosmia, when you lose the sense, parosmia, when it's distorted and you smell something that's not there. Um, we're kind of at the at the beginning, I think, still of of uncovering what this sense really means to us. Yeah, and and I suppose it's um, you know m maybe it, it would end up uh, maybe you could do something if you could develop you know some kind of prosthetic device that you would you know fit over your nose and then uh, you you had some way of stimulating the or the receptors uh in a way that would mimic uh actual contact with with volatiles right. with right. uh with the the material world around us um maybe that's uh, a, a long, long, long-term possibility. I, I think long, long, yeah. I have no idea how that would work, but it would be fun if it existed. And, you know, that would be like kind of, um, you know, an entertainment device, but people have lost their sense of smell. And so the receptors aren't there or the cells that have the receptors aren't there, but there's still an olfactory nerve that pokes out of your brain through your skull. Maybe that could be stimulated to create, instead of a hearing aid, um, a, a smell aid or something like that. I mean, we don't, know how to do that but we we've, we're used to that idea and vision and hearing like i have corrective vision you have corrective vision you know there's glasses and there has been since the invention of optics but we can't rescue or augment our sense of smell yeah yeah and maybe it's partly you know the fact that uh it is this it, it is such a basic um element of living things to be able to sense the 
things around you to know, you know, what direction to swim in to get food, what direction to move in to avoid trouble. Um, and uh, it, it's, uh, yeah, maybe because it is so, so basic and so primitive in that sense, maybe it's going to be the most challenging to, uh, to fiddle with. <laughs> Yeah, there's this concept um, called Moravec's paradox. Have you heard of Have you heard of this term? No. It's by uh, this uh, kind of, I guess, philosopher or just scientist, um, Hans Moravec. And the idea is that the easier it is for us to do, the harder it is to make a computer do it. By virtue of the fact that because it's so automatic, it's been uh, tinkered on by evolution for millions, tens, hundreds of millions of years, and so you know, things that are hard for us, like abstract thinking and logic and arithmetic it just appeared in the blink of an eye in evolutionary time. And although they feel hard for us, they're actually easy to get computers to do. But something like walking and opening a door is something robots today still really can't do. And so maybe smell, you know, belongs in that pantheon of, of evolutionarily old and quite computationally challenging things. Yeah, yeah, and and I keep coming back to the fact that you know it is, uh, and it's still something that um, that I uh, wonder at, um, you know, marvel at, that we're actually when we experience a smell, detecting and encountering and experiencing little bits of the material world, right? You know, not not an epiphenomenon, but the world itself, and so substituting for that, I think, is that's that's a challenge that's <laughs> yeah, a bit wild i mean it is a bit of a like a kind of a mental mind twisting thing that when you smell a rose rose just touched your brain like literally you know the the things that do the sensing for for our sense of smell are from our brain poking out through our skull our our sense of smell is the one of the only two places where our brain leaves our skull the other one's the pituitary gland and that's sitting in our bloodstream but Literally, rose is entering our brain. You know, when we smell a rose, I think that's just this tick, tickles my tickles my senses. I guess. <laughs> yeah, and also the uh, the fact that you know when when the receptor binds that uh, rose oxide for a moment, that rose oxide is part of us. Yeah, right? we're we're incorporating it. We're getting rid of it. Then it takes a while to get rid of it, but we do get rid of it. But it's um, in its own way a bit like taking food in. You know, it's. Mm part of us. Mm. For as intimate as the experience is, right, as you said, literally taking things into us, we sure have a hard time describing it, though. And the lexicon for describing the words that we use to describe odors seem limited when you compare it to like, you know, colors like, you know, light blue fuchsia, we have all these color names that we learn. But relatively few, at least when we're growing up for, for odor. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I guess, uh, I mean, neurobiologists have been, um, uh, trying to understand why that is, uh, still are as far as I can tell. Um, but I guess it's also, you know, again, the fact that we, we encounter these things, these, these sensations arise from our encounters with things in the world in a way that's not necessarily the case for our other senses. And so we have this very strong connection between that sensation and that source. And so that's how we end up describing things is, um, you know, ginger smells like ginger, not like an ant because we've most of us uh, encountered it in this plant, in the spice and not in the, not in the insect. Um, so yeah, it's um, I, I think un understandable. Uh, it it's also I I think though another reason to just kind of explore this world of smells um, more frequently and and uh, in a little bit more detail because that helps you I think uh, come up with uh, if not new words to describe things then at least uh, to to enlarge the cluster of words that makes sense for you to, to describe a particular thing. There are people uh, in the perfume world who have tried to come up with uh, a, a, a language for smells, you know, completely like, like Esperanto or something like that. Hmm. 
describe smells. Um, I, I've taken a look and, you know, it's, uh, that would take a lot of work. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I think would also have the disadvantage of just, um, again, taking us away from the, the immediacy of what it is that these things actually are connected to and uh, the things that, that make them and, and what that tells us about the world. It's hard to escape from that because I actually can't think of a word for smell that isn't literally the thing it comes from, right? Orange, lavender, apple, cedar. Like those are all living things that produce smells. And there's a characteristic emblematic smell, but are there any abstract terms for smell? Well, um, yeah, not that I can think of off offhand. Um, I mean, of course, with the advent of chemistry and being able to describe molecules, uh, we can now talk about, I, I mentioned uh, rose oxide as mm. being you know, this particular molecule that does um, uh, play an important role in the smell of roses. On the other hand, you know, rose oxide has the, the word rose in it. Yeah. <laughs> you, you could also describe it, you know, in, in purely chemical uh, terminology. Um, uh, that would describe its structure exactly, but um, yeah, that's not going to have much purchase uh, with with most of us. And it doesn't work either. I mean, that's something that that um, the group that I work with studies is the relationship between what a molecule looks like, what its structure is, and what it ultimately smells like. And the answer is it's very complicated, and you cannot look at the structure of a molecule and tell with your eyes what it's going to smell like. Because you can move one electron around and you can go from roses to rotten eggs or the smell of fresh laundry to absolutely no odor. Uh, it's a pretty, pretty wild relationship. And I don't think I don't think it's well understood. I think we've got a lot of a lot of uh, road yet to travel there. Yeah, that's for me. One of the exciting things is that, uh, you know, I uh, kind of set flavor aside for a couple of decades, then came back to it um, and started writing this book in 2000, in a serious way in, in 2010. Um, and then just in the last four or five years, there's been this wonderful efflorescence of uh, studies and, and interest in smell just across the spectrum, including philosophy, you know. Mm. The, philosophy of smell. Yeah, yeah, there's a, a wonderful book, uh, called Smellosophy, <laughs> which I highly recommend. Okay, and, I'll, I'll get it. Yeah, it, it makes the point that, um, you know, our, our uh, models for understanding how the brain works have, have by and large been based for a long time on vision um, and, and um, you know, the formation of images and so on. And it, it Smell is such a different sensory modality that the brain is just as good at and maybe better at and has been doing for longer um, that it has important things to tell us about uh, the nature of consciousness and the relationship between us and the world around us that um, vision and the other senses don't offer. So um, it's just a... a, a we realize now how little we know, but it feels to me as though with books like that and the research that your group is doing and so and on. And your book, certainly. It's, um, yeah, just become a very, very exciting part of life. That's excellent. Well, we've got 11 minutes left and there's some questions in the chat. Um, I see there's some activity around people volunteering abstract terms for smell, which is awesome. I'm seeing acidic, acrid, harsh, burning, stinging, plain old stinky. Um, and one thing that I kind of notice there is that a, a lot of those terms ha are trigeminal. So there's a separate sensing system in your nose, which is what smelling salts, you know, kind of give you. That's the horseradish also feeling. And so this notion of fullness or sharpness is, is, uh, it's not really well known, but I, I think that might be even a, se a separate sensory system. Uh, this kind of the activation of the trigeminal uh, nerve and then, you know, salty, savory, you know, uh, sweet. Those are abstract, but uh, also those are taste. Um, so there's a couple systems collaborating here. Yeah, uh, one of the things that uh, I, I really puzzled over um, in print in the book because I couldn't really come up with a 
uh, you know, a, a tidy way of thinking about it is the use of the word sweet to mm. describe smells that, uh, that we like. Mm. Uh, and it's often applied to <clears throat> things that we don't eat, you know, things that we don't have actual um, uh, experience of their taste. Uh, and it's often been said by sensory scientists that uh, calling a smell sweet is a confusion of categories because mm. sweetness is a taste, not a smell. Mm. If you actually look at the history of the, the use of the word, you know, of course, it goes way, way back to, um, uh, to medieval times and has been used more and more, uh, more often than not for a way to describe something as being pleasant. Ah, so just like good or bad, like I like it or it's gross, uh, or but but good in a particular way, you know, kind of soothing. Uh, and, I see. Um, uh, so, so not like edible good, but like soothing good. Yeah. So mm. I think this idea that that sweet is is by definition a taste term just ignores um, you know philological history, <laughs> and that we should we should uh, embrace it and ask the question: What is it about a smell? Um, you know, two two different smells that both smell sweet, but they're different smells. Mm. What's what's the quality that they have in common? Right. And you know, where where in the system of our perception might that um, correspondence arise? That's interesting. And uh, your your literary background is a great asset here in <laughs> in dissecting these taxonomies. That's awesome. Um, I want to take another question here. Uh, from uh, Yuki Jung, uh, how does concentration impact how a smell is perceived? So we, is this like, um, is this like uh, mental concentration or I, maybe perhaps like the, we, we did discuss like um, closeness to something and the, the amount of the molecule. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the, the, uh, the concentration of the molecule in the air we're breathing has a tremendous impact on uh, on how we perceive it, and so there are uh, many examples of smells that, at very low levels or even not so low levels, are pleasant. But then the stronger they get, the less pleasant they get. And my guess is that that might be true, kind of in in general, that even the most pleasant smells, if they're you know suffocatingly <laughs> concentrated, are not going to smell so good. Um, but there are, uh, for example, um, uh, hydrogen sulfide, very simple molecule, um, kind of primeval molecule, which is what gives you the smell of freshly cooked eggs. Mm. Um, but if it's uh, if if you go to uh, you know the the mouth of all of a volcano, or you go to uh, uh, hot springs. It's often being emitted by um, by the uh, volcanic activity just under the earth, and it's way more concentrated there, and it's choking. It's yeah. uh, it's way too much. This much is the answer to the question of what came first, the smell of the chicken egg or the 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 chicken egg itself, and it's clearly the belching earth that came first. Yes. Yes. <laughs> So two more questions, uh, and then we'll see how we are on time. Uh, one, there's been a couple questions on this topic of aromatherapy, uh, or generally smells influencing mood. So I'll kind of just paraphrase both, both questions, but um, yeah, wh what, what is the, what's the status here of our understanding? Can smells actually influence our mood? And what can we do if they can to make ourselves feel better? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, uh, it, it's a, a very mixed literature, <laughs> put it that way. Uh, it does seem that, um, that you can change people's mood by changing the uh, aromas in the air that they're breathing. Um, but it's kind of predictable that, you know, mm -hmm. the smell of lavender or the smell of lemon is... Um, uh, tends to improve mood and bad smells, unpleasant smells tend uh, to do the reverse. Uh, and then there are uh, some studies that talk about um, whether some are some aromas are uh, excitatory and others might be relaxing. Um, 
there i i think it's much harder to tell i mean there there are studies that uh, are that have both positive and negative findings on that score but it it's clearly the case that um we we're registering the the smells of the space that we're occupying and that uh they those smells can affect the way we feel just in general not just um not just um uh, you know whether whether we're paying attention or not. I I am going to get a kick out of this next question because it's partially selfish for me to highlight it. But if you had a team of computer scientists, <laughs> uh, uh, computer science researchers at your disposal, what questions would you want answered? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I I think that's exactly what you all are up to. <laughs> Uh, and that is to say, uh, to what, what I would love for computer scientists to do is to kind of collate what we know about mm. the um, the universe of smells uh, as we have them on uh, in in our everyday lives, um, and then try to make sense of that. You know, try to um, uh, to see whether uh, whether that's all there is or whether because, you know, um, carbon is an amazingly versatile molecule, uh, uh, atom that, uh, plays very well with lots of other atoms and can form countless, countless different permutations and combinations, whether there, there might be smells that, um, are actually in the world that we haven't yet experienced because we just haven't paid attention or because they're masked by more dominant smell mm -hmm. or whether the, there are things that um, plants and animals haven't yet bothered to come up with uh, that chemists can come up with that, that might have interesting qualities so i think there's there's there is this um you know um uh, otherwise intractable number of possible molecules and sensations out there. And it would be great if uh, computer scientists could help us navigate. There's a request from a consummate lover of food, which is to, to bring you a new flavor that you've never <laughs> experienced before. <laughs> or, or even just a new aroma. I mean, I, I don't have to ingest it. I've, I've learned to enjoy these things without, without actually uh, taking them in. I see. We'll take that one too. All right. Well, challenge accepted. We'll do our best. <laughs> um, oh, one one good question here um, that uh, yeah would be good to address is this notion of pheromones. And so we talked about mood um, and lavender potentially making us feel better. Bad corpse smells making us feel worse. Um, but there's this there's a special kind of chemical um, by virtue of what it does, not necessarily what it looks like, called a pheromone. And they do exist in, in animals. They, you know, there's molecules that can deterministically steer the behavior of the recipient one way or the other. But uh, do humans um, have the ability to respond to pheromones? So uh, my understanding of the, uh, uh, of scientists' understanding to date is that uh, we don't have good evidence yet of, of a particular of the existence of particular pheromones that influence particular human behaviors. On the other hand, there does seem to be uh, increasingly good evidence that there are um, volatile molecules that influence us subconsciously uh, in and maybe kind of predispose us to like things or not to like things, to feel comfortable or not to feel comfortable. So they don't actually, in the classic definition of a pheromone, you know, determine a particular behavior, but they influence our, our just general perception of things. That, that does seem to be the case. And uh, that's a really exciting area of research. Hmm. Well, we're almost up at time. Uh, so I just wanted to say thanks. I had a great time talking with you today, Harold. Um, and uh, thanks again for working on the book and sharing it with the world. It's, it's been tremendously influential on me. Uh, and thanks for, for chatting today. My pleasure, Alex. It's been uh, wonderful to come back. <laughs>